Hello, I'm Julian McCary. I'm going to have to be very careful with this microphone because I'm already very loud as it is. So <laughs> tell me if I start yelling at you. Um, like she said, I wrote this paper for uh, Literature for Young Adults. A little bit about the class. At the beginning of the semester, we picked nine uh, young adult books that we're going to write various papers with throughout the semester. This particular book, John Green's Looking for Alaska, I picked to write this research paper about. And if you have not read this book or any of John Green's other books, you really should. This promotional, his books are the best. She made me fall in love with them. And they're very, very liter literary, have lots of literary merit. And they're just a good read. So if you haven't, you should really check them out. But down to business. Crossing the Alaskan border, literature for young adults in the 21st century. But before we get to talk about the 21st century, we have to go on a little time travel journey. It's 1975, uh, the height of the first golden age of literature for young adults. Judy Bloom has just published her One Day Will Be Absolutely Famous novel, Forever. Only, it's not a young adult book. It's years later in an interview, Bloom expresses her surprise and shock when she read that it had been marketed as an adult book not a young adult book as she had originally intended. This classification is due to its content, a teenage boy and girl experiencing their first set feelings of sexual intimacy and exploring the emotional, physical, and moral implications of their actions. John Green's Looking for Alaska, published 30 years later, also deals with these implications uh, with its pr protagonists having sexual I I experiences. However, unlike Forever, this type of content was considered appropriate for young adults, if at least by the publishers, if not by parents. So what's the difference? Both books exhibit these characteristics, the six things that classify literature for young adults. So it can't be context alone. They're both written from the perspective of young adults, uh, ultimately optimistic, but the protagonists learn beneficial life lessons. They are relatively fast-paced and contain those elements of literature that make it oh so lovable and worth reading. So perhaps the change is not so much in the genre itself as it is also in society, in that the themes are the same, but their presentation is different because of the difference in society. Young adult author and reviewer Sue Corbett is certain that today, Forever would certainly be published as a young adult novel, mainly because she says once taboo subjects are now widely accepted. In their article, What's Happening in Young Adult Literature, Trends in Books for Adolescents, published in the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy. Melanie Koss and William Teal explored the changes in literature for young adults in the 21st century to shed light on how the genre of, this, of, genre of literature for young adults has grown up in the, in the 21st century since its inception. All puns are intentional, I promise. <laughs> However, before we get to talking about the genre itself, we have to talk a little bit about society and the almighty dollar. Over any market, money is the most controlling factor, and literature and the publishing houses that control it are no exception. Koss and Teal report that the burgeoning interest in the market of products designed for the young adult have been spurred by one of the fastest growing segments of the U.S. population, adolescents. According to the last census, Generation Y, or the Millennials as we're also called, make up a quarter of the population. That's about 77 million people. According to their 2009 research, authors during the second golden age, which occurred during the early 1990s, uh, reached this dynamic, diverse, and very plugged-in generation by shifting away from coming-of-age novels to focus on books with themes of fitting in and finding oneself and dealing with major life changes. Mark McVeigh, a senior editor at Dutton Children's Books, explains this shift as being in response to the way children's, today's adolescents approach their world saying, the lives of kids today are barely recognizable from the childhoods anybody over 30 led in the way they approach sex, drugs, alcohol, and parental attention. In order to remain relevant, authors and their writing had to grow to meet their readers' needs, while still tackling the big issues like class, race, love, life, and death. These works are also moving to focus on a more general theme of teens struggling to find themselves and dealing with typical teenage life. <coughs> in Looking for Alaska, John Green reflects this shift. Now, in the highly contested sexual encounter of Looking for Alaska, what anyone cites as being the reason to censor this book, the protagonist, Miles Pudge Halter, and his girlfriend, Laura, in attempt, the operative word being attempt, to engage in fellatio for the first time. 
However, in the book, this act is not glorified or even romanticized in the least. It is portrayed instead as awkward, uncomfortable, embarrassing, which is a far closer reality to what kids actually experience than these lovable, romantic Hollywood versions. This type of realistic content presentation, while definitely geared toward a more mature young adult reader, is almost conditional in contemporary young adult books. It is a realistic representation that prepares adolescents for their own experiences. As their lives become more complicated, there is a need for the literature written for them to reflect their lives. The way Green depicts how Pudge and Laura deal with this episode of typical teenage life is telling of how much it shifted in the 21st century. Another major life change for Pudge is Alaska's death. Sorry, spoilers, but it's kind of what the book's about. Um, where her death represents the change from coming of age to finding oneself, because after her death, he feels the need to make sense of it. He needs to make sense of her life, the events leading up to her death, and her death itself. But in this journey, he doesn't discover as much about Alaska as he does himself. After his reflection on his time with Alaska, he realizes that he had been living without hope, but one that need never be hopeless, because one is never irreparably broken. By the end of the work, Pudge has matured and become a wiser young adult, but he's still definitely plagued by the problems of young teenage life, like term papers and the exam that ultimately ends the book. Just like young adults coming to terms with their new experiences, the journey into adulthood has only just begun, and Pudge has taken his first steps. Though society itself and the young adults growing up in it today may have changed from 30 years ago, some individuals may have not. Despite being on the New York Times bestseller list in 2012 and winning the Michael L. Prince Award in Excellence for Young Adult Literature in 2006, a very prestigious award for young adult literature, uh, it was still number seven on the 2012 list of the American Library Association's top ten challenged books. While the ALA reports 5,099, literally that, 5,099 challenges against various works of literature, many of those young adult books, it would seem that young Looking for Alaska is in very good company. Many of those 5,099 books are very high quality books. Uh, the true, true story, story of a part-time Indian, um, Speak, 13 Reasons Why are all uh, challenged books, but they have great literary merit themselves. Um, it is, it, this is exactly, exactly the type of treatment a modern writer of literature for young adults should expect from a generation of adults who may not be able to understand the challenges that are placed upon young adults today. Young adults, we're called young adults for a reason, let's be honest. It's indicative of our status. The crushing reality of the real world is infringing upon our safety net of childhood, and we're being bombarded with information costs, as Teal say, with information about what's hot, what's not, and what it means to be cool. Simultaneously, we're dealing with responsibilities and consequences for our actions that we have never before encountered. Child psychologist Bruno Bettelheim suggests that it is these stories with challenging themes that give full credence to the seriousness of the child's problems, while simultaneously promoting confidence in the reader and in his or her future. Reading literature that portrays this real experience of finding oneself and fitting in, as literature for young adults does in the 21st century, gives today's young adults the opportunity to play with their identities in a safe and controlled manner to explore who they are and who they want to be in this ever-changing world. Without these opportunities to vicariously experience the pain, embarrassment, and disappointment, along with the joy, beauty, and love that life can offer, young adults will emerge into the world as half-prepared adults, still trying to discover who they are. In Pudge's own words, and much like the genre of literature for young adults as it continues to develop and into the future, one cannot be born and one cannot die. We can only change shapes and sizes and manifestations. And that part of us, greater than some of our parts, cannot begin and cannot end. So it cannot fail. Thank you. Do you have any questions?